It is 7 o'clock Wednesday evening. We greet you this evening from the Huntsville, Alabama area in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are Forward Christian Life Center, a brand new work here in the Huntsville area. After uh, over 21 years of ministry in Dallas, Texas, my partner of 22 plus years got a job here in the Huntsville area, we had to relocate, and that meant we had to relocate our ministry as well. So, we are just trying to get something off the ground. If you live in the Huntsville, Alabama area, and you are a progressive uh, believer, especially a progressive, spirit-filled believer, and you're tired of the homophobia, the hate, the vitriol, the politics, and all the other foolishness, the misogyny, uh, the xenophobia that we see rampant in the evangelical church today, then believe it or not, there is a church out there uh, that you can really benefit from and be blessed by. We are a progressive, spirit-filled church. Uh, there are issues the church has not had right, folks, for a long, long time. And uh, if you do a little bit of study, if you dig into the Word of God, you will find out that... Um, there's a lot of stuff that has just been misunderstood, uh, mishandled, mistreated. And uh, so anyway, we invite you to come worship with us Sunday at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time. Our meeting location is the Century Office Center, 3322 uh, Memorial Parkway Southwest. Suite number 537, that is in Huntsville, Alabama, 35801. Come be with us. Check out, check out our church online at www.forwardclc, F-O-R-W-A-R-D-C-L-C, all one word, dot com. And that'll tell you all about our church and give you some idea of uh, who I am and what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is exciting. Uh, it will be a boon for this area. It'll be a boon for this state. I know a lot of people on the conservative side of the spectrum uh, don't think so, but that's okay. I don't care what they think. I know what God is trying to do. And the Lord has said, I'm going to do a new thing. Hallelujah. And before I do it, I'm going to tell you all about it. Praise the name of the Lord. So we want to get going with our Bible study tonight. We are in the midst of a, a very in-depth look at all things paranormal from a biblical Christian perspective. Uh, this is, in effect, a study on spiritual warfare. Um, I've titled it Ghosts, Ghouls, and Bumps in the Night, and uh, hoping that that would be uh, of interest to folks, that that might help people uh, find this study who otherwise wouldn't uh, stop to look at something that was titled, you know, Spiritual Warfare. So, uh, we are going to be looking in the near future. We're going to be looking at a number of issues like hauntings, ghosts, uh, things of this nature. But thus far, we have been looking at uh, the entire concept of the spirit world, the spirit realm, what it consists of. And uh, now, the last few weeks, we've been looking at the... Um, rules that apply, as it were, to the spirit realm. And um, we've been talking about the fact that the spirit realm requires permission or it requires a door to have been opened intentionally or unintentionally in order for a spirit to uh, trespass upon the life of an individual 
And uh, we then began to look at the specific ways that doors are opened unintentionally and intentionally. And some of you may think, well, what does this have to do with the paranormal? What does this have to do with hauntings and ghosts and things? Believe me, as we move forward in this study, we're going we're gonna to be able to jump back to a lot of what we've been talking about. And it'll make perfect sense. Everything's going to come together for you. But I'm trying to lay it out in a structured, meaningful way. Before we go in tonight's study, as always, I'd like to go to the Lord in prayer, if you'll bow your heads with me. <clears throat> Father, we thank you, God, this evening for the opportunity once again to study the Word of God. There is no greater privilege for God's people than to delve into this wonderful sacred script which you have provided for us, the source of all truth and blessing in our lives. Master, in the name of Jesus, we pray, God, that tonight you would anoint the messenger, you would anoint those that hear. Allow our ears to be open that we might be able and ready and willing to receive tonight from the Word of God by reason of your Spirit. Help me to deliver to the people of God that which you would have me to deliver. Master, in the name of Jesus, use this study to bring victory and deliverance to those who are bound and oppressed by the enemy, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I'm an old man, so I've got to put my glasses on so I can see. We've been talking about doors uh, being open to the enemy intentionally or unintentionally. Um, again, I'm going to use the analogy I've been using all along, so anyone who's joining us for the first time can understand what I mean and what I'm saying. Um, if you let your dogs out like we do, we open the back door, let the dogs out into the yard to run and do their business and play and get some exercise. Uh, if I leave my screen door unlocked, and then on top of that, I leave my interior door ajar, I have not opened the door wide and invited a thief or someone who wishes to do me harm uh, into my home. I've not intentionally opened the door and said, hey, anybody out there want to do me harm? Anybody out there wants to rob us? Hey, I'm leaving the screen door unlocked. I'm leaving the interior door ajar. No, I'm not doing that, obviously. However, by reason of that simple neglect, I have left the door open. And if someone uh, were able and desirous of taking advantage of the opportunity, seeing that I leave my screen door unlocked, seeing that I leave the interior door ajar when I let the dogs out. All they'd have to do is wait, and when I let the dogs out the next time, uh, they can wait for me to go back into the house and then slip right in, and God only knows what could happen then. So, the enemy works in similar fashion. Uh, demons do not rely upon a, a welcome mat. They do not require a lit sign that says, welcome, come on in. No, they look for chinks in the armor. They look for weaknesses. They look... Uh, the Word of God said that our adversary, the devil, roameth about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. A roaring lion, uh, a lion hunts and looks for the weak, looks for the sick, looks for that one which has been separated from the pack. And uh, they're, they're looking, as I say, for that chink, you know, they're looking for that weak spot in the fence. They're looking for that weak spot 
in your armor. And this is why, as children of God, it's imperative that we do our best to live a godly life and we pursue a godly life because in so doing, we are able to live free of influences that are unwelcome. All demonic spirits, all evil spirits are trespassers. Uh, whether the person is a Christian or whether the individual is not a Christian, whether they be vexed um, or uh, possessed or whatever the case might be, uh, the reality is all demon spirits are trespassers. They do not belong in the life of any individual, but they are squatters. You know, they, they look, if a house is empty, if a house is available to them, if the door has been left ajar or the door has been opened wide open, um, they're going to come on in and they're going to take up residence and they're going to do everything in their power to wreak havoc in the life of the individual that they are uh, vexing. And so um, it's imperative that believers, you know, uh, a child of God can easily be vexed by a spirit. And a spirit can also easily attach itself to a believer so that it has... Um, become an oppression. So you ha we were talking about the three levels, vexation, oppression, and possession. Yes, a child of God can be oppressed. Some people say, well, Christians can't possibly be possessed by a devil. The only problem with that statement is not everybody who identifies as a Christian is in fact a Christian. Therefore, yes, there are people out there who call themselves Christians who in fact have a demon as, as real as any unsaved person could have. Um, people fail to understand. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. God knows whether that person is sincerely even attempting to serve him or if they're simply embracing the religion uh, for whatever purpose. There are men, especially in a lot of the evangelical circles, there are men who adore uh, evangelical Christianity because of the misogynistic teaching. And they're able to, you know, slap their wife down into submission and use the teaching of the Southern Baptist Convention to justify uh, their taking the approach that they take. So, not everybody who calls himself a Christian is in fact a Christian. And therefore, you really cannot say in truth that a, quote, Christian cannot be possessed by a demon. Yes, they can. Someone who professes Christianity, yes, they can. And believe me when I tell you, I have been in many a church in my day uh, that has had members who were demoniac as anything I've ever seen in my life. If you look at the testimony of Scripture, Jesus went into the temple, and there were times in the temple when he came upon those who were vexed, oppressed, and possessed by demons. So demons will go to church, especially if they're using the teaching of that church um, to promote a false religious theory or a false, re false religious thinking. And there are such things. There is a category of demonic spirits that are referred to as religious spirits. They literally operate within religious circles. They help to 
um, cultivate an individual's uh, mishandling of the Word of God and abuse of the Word of God. They love, demons love to make Christianity look terrible. They love to get into somebody who's playing games with God, who is not genuinely born again, who is not genuinely trying to live the life that the Word of God calls us to, and they love to get into a life like that and then create havoc in the church, create havoc in a home, create havoc in a community. Folks, we are seeing this at a massive wholesale level in America today. Many, 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 many people in the mega uh, evangelical movement have religious demons. And I'm not kidding. I'm not, I'm not joking in the least. Uh, if these people ever got delivered from these demons, they would suddenly realize that the religion they follow, the religion they embrace, meaning the rules, the teachings that they embrace, uh, are entirely erroneous and false and inaccurate and incorrect. Um, but the Word of God told us in the last days, many false prophets should arise and would deceive many. So why it is that people do not understand if you believe we're in the last days, then you have to believe that there are many false teachers, many false prophets out there, and that they are doing a deceptive work. That is Satan's operation. His entire goal in the end is to deceive. That is his, that is what demons do. That is their job. And therefore, a false teacher, a false prophet is going to deceive God's people. It's one thing to lead God's people into deeper truth and help them live more and more a life of love, a life of, of uh, charity, a life of mercy and grace. It is something altogether different to teach something that motivates God's people to be filled with angst and filled with anger, that motivates them to become politically um, uh, can't think of the word I want to use at the moment here. Uh, militant. There you go. Took me a minute. I told you the preacher's old, okay? So, um, it's important to understand, yeah, there are religious spirits, okay? Now, we want to move further into what we were talking about last week. Last week, we were talking about the fact that uh, evil spirits, demons, love to take advantage of ungodliness, and they perceive ungodliness as an outright invitation. By ungodliness, what we mean is behavior that is entirely contrary to God and contrary to the truth of God. A lot of people don't understand, but terms like wickedness, evil, ungodliness, they do not all share the same definition. They do not all mean the same thing. Um, the Word of God said, If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the sinner and the ungodly stand? Well, you would think that the ungodly would be the same as the sinner. But it's not. The ungodly applies to those who claim some allegiance to God. They claim to follow the Lord at some level, but they're not living in keeping with his teaching. And people who are hateful, people who are uh, nasty and malicious and homophobic and xenophobic and uh, uh, 
misogynistic and these sort of things. Folks, those things are contrary to the teaching of God's Word. You cannot live like that and call yourself a Christian. Jesus made it abundantly clear. Love your enemies. Pray for them which spitefully use you. He said, if you love those that love you back, he said, what have you done? Nothing. Even the sinner loves those that love them back. So, a Christian is supposed to rise above the fray of this world. We're supposed to rise above the standard of conduct in this world. The world says love back those that love you and hate those with whom you disagree and those whom you don't like. But that is not in keeping with Christian teaching. I dare say this ministry spends more time than any church I know trying to encourage God's people to live God's standard and to live the way that the Lord has taught us to live, to love people, to be merciful, to be gracious, to be understanding. And uh, even when you don't understand somebody, you don't understand their choices, you don't understand their life, you don't understand uh, issues and circumstances in their life, it is not given us by the Lord the right or the responsibility to sin in judgment or condemnation of them, especially if they're trying to live for God. Everybody in the church preaching and everybody else is sheer confusion. And that's what we see in the church world today. Instead of following the Apostle Paul's teaching, let every man work out his own salvation with fear and trembling. Instead of each of us working on our own walk with God and looking at our neighbor and loving our neighbor as the Word of God tells us plainly we're supposed to do, love your neighbor as yourself. Instead of doing this, we're looking at our neighbor, we're looking at the person across the street, we're looking at that gay couple down the road, we're looking at this one and that one, and we're sitting in judgment and condemnation. We're treating them poorly because we disagree with the, their life and their decisions. Sweetheart, got news for you. Your opinion concerning them is not going to move God in the final analysis one single bit. God doesn't care about your opinion. There's, he doesn't care about your opinion on abortion. He doesn't care about your opinion on gay rights. God doesn't care about your opinion on any of those things because your opinion on any of those things, according to biblical teaching, should never, ever motivate you to treat anyone with anything but love and grace. That's biblical teaching. I don't know what they tell you at First Baptist. I don't know what they tell you at First Assembly of God, but that is biblical Christian teaching. Now, last week we were talking about, as I say, godlessness, meaning God's people not living as uh, God's people ought to live. Godliness is striving to be like God. Ungodliness is embracing those things and doing those things which are completely in contrast to God. In Ephesians 5, 1 through 7, the Apostle Paul writes, Be ye therefore followers of God. See, this is what godliness is, a follower of God. As dear children, just like a child tries to walk in the footsteps of their father, just as a child learns from the example of their parents, we too ought to try to walk 
in the footsteps of the Lord and to be more and more like him. Paul continues in verse 2, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking, nor just, oh, everybody wants to jump on the fornication bandwagon. Everybody wants to jump on this point or that point. And then they ignore everything that follows. But listen to what follows. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of this obedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Colossians 3, 5 through 15. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on, listen, the children of disobedience. Again, you notice I'm talking about godliness is striving to be like God. We're trying to obey. We're trying to do what he's taught us, commanded us, instructed us to do in his word. Paul's referring to children of disobedience. So this clearly hearkens to the ungodly. This isn't about the wicked. This isn't about the evil. Those people are outside of the church altogether. Those people have nothing to do with the faith. No, this has to do with people uh, like parents, for instance, who have a child uh, who they've tried to raise well, but that child is rebellious and disobedient, okay? There are many in the church, my friend, who are rebellious and disobedient to the teachings of God's Word, and that's why the church is in the mess it's in today. That's why we have mega. That's why we have Christian nationalism, because people are perverting and twisting and polluting the Word of God to try to make it suit them, and the actions and the deeds that they are embracing, the attitudes, the behaviors that they are embracing are in complete and utter contradiction to the teaching of God's Word. And the church is suffering. The reputation of Christianity is suffering because of this. Paul continues in Colossians 3. Uh, uh, again, verse 6, For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, listen, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge 
after the image of him that created him. Again, it's trying to be more like daddy. It's trying to be more like our father, godliness. Verse 11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, listen, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, listen, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be thankful. When's the last time you heard a sermon where they even talked about what I'm reading to you tonight? When's the last time you heard a preacher on television talking about how we're supposed to be people of peace. We're supposed to be people of love. We're supposed to be people of forgiveness. We're supposed to be people of mercy. When's the last time you heard that sermon preached in your church or on a television uh, evangelist's program? In Revelation 9, 20 through 21, and the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. In Acts chapter 19, excuse me, 15, verses 24 through 29. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us, have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, Ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. This is the apostles at Jerusalem sending word out to the uh, Gentile churches because there were certain uh, Jewish converts to Christianity who were trying to teach that in order to be saved, you also had to keep the law. Folks, we got churches full of preachers today. We got churches full of Christians today who are teaching that in order to be saved, you have to keep the law. There's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. The same problems that existed in the first century church exist in the 21st century church. And unfortunately, we don't see it that way. We don't appreciate that this is what is happening. But that's exactly what is happening. So this is the apostle saying, we, those of us who have been given by God, through Christ, the authority to establish doctrine and truth in the church, we alone have that authority, and we did not authorize these individuals to go out and to teach such teaching. They go on to say, It seemed good unto us 
being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. So Barnabas and Paul are carrying the letter, they're carrying the printed message, and then they're sending out uh, Judas and Silas to verbally confirm what the apostles have said. Why would they do this? Come on, saints, those of you who have been under this teaching for a while, why do you think the apostles would do this? Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So Paul and Barnabas are serving as witnesses, and then separate from them we have, excuse me, Judas and Silas serving as witnesses to the message that the apostles wanted to convey to the Gentile church. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas who will also, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. So they're saying, as it relates to the law, there is a very limited number of things that you need even be concerned about. And it's not because it's about keeping part of the law, but if you understand the things that they they instruct the churches to embrace and to follow, you understand that it all boils down to trying to keep the early church away from idolatry, okay? So they said, to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, idolatry, and from blood, idolatry, and from things strangled, idolatry, and from fornication. The people don't understand. This term generally has idolatrous uh, association. When you see the word fornication, you know, the modern church has gone off and created its own definition of fornication. But uh, included in this term is religious or ritual sexual activity, idolatrous activity, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well. Fare ye well. So, if you're not going to try to live a life of love, if you're not going to try to love your enemies, if you're not going to pray for them which spitefully use you, if you're not going to treat those who treat you poorly well, if you're not going to do as the Word of God instructs us to do, and you purposely are going to run around with a heart full of angst and anger and malice, and you're constantly going to be screaming and hollering at the gay people, going to pride parades and declaring the judgment of God and, you know, pronouncing the fire of God upon these people. Uh, if you're going to conduct yourself like that, my friend, I've got news for you. You are behaving in a manner that is completely contradictory to godliness, and you are opening yourself up to a spiritual attachment. You are opening yourself up to vexation leading to oppression. And for those of you who are just using religion to be hateful and nasty and mean, and believe me, there are people out there who do that, full-blown possession is in your forecast. So ungodliness doing completely contradictory to that which God teaches us to do. 
is an invitation or seen by an invitation to the enemy. Now, evil spirits, the enemy takes advantage of a spiritual interaction. What I mean by this is occult or idolatrous practices. So people who engage in occult or idolatrous practices are opening themselves up to a potential vexation followed by an oppression with the ultimate end potentially being full-blown possession. This is why within the context of the law, the Lord said in Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 12, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. And again, the term abom abominations has a direct relevance to idolatry. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Leviticus 19.31 Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards, to be defiled by them, I am the Lord your God. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 20, Paul writes, But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God, and I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Again, interaction with uh, occult and or idolatrous practices were not to do this. Ephesians 5.11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. More people have opened a door to the enemy. Excuse me one second. More people have opened a door to the enemy by um, engaging in some sort of uh, spiritual interaction, some sort of spiritual practice involving the occult and or idolatry. And next thing you know, they're having all kinds of troubles and all of a sudden, uh, just seems like things are going haywire in their life. If you watch a lot of these paranormal television shows, uh, you often see that people have trouble, especially after messing with um, uh, Ouija boards, spirit boards. Uh, that is probably one of the most common ways that I've seen people invite demonic uh, entities into their lives, and they don't realize what they're doing, you know. Uh, but, uh, and we're going to get into this in a whole lot more detail in the future, but I'll kind of give you a quick synopsis, a, a quick glimpse. Folks, when you interact with the spirit realm, it is utter insanity to believe for one second that you know anything about what you're doing. I don't care if you've been doing paranormal investigations for a hundred years. I don't care if you've claimed to be a psychic or a medium for 90 years. I don't care how many seances 
or, or how many spirit board sessions you have uh, participated in. The bottom line is you're interacting with something that is invisible. Somebody could walk through this store right now and introduce them to me, introduce themselves to me and say, Hi, my name is Andy Griffith. I'm the sheriff of Decatur, Alabama. Or, I, so I guess, you know, I have to assume this guy's name is Andy Griffith and he's the sheriff of Alabama until I'm able to research and find out whether or not that's factual. Okay. But when you're dealing with something invisible and unseen, they can tell you they're anybody they want to tell you they are. They can tell you anything they want to tell you. And if they use information that coincides with the history of a property or coincides with the personal history of an individual, that would seem to give it credibility. However, what method are you able to employ to guarantee that this invisible entity is speaking the truth to you? I watch these people on these shows all the time and it makes me laugh because they stand there and they use all these different tools of divination. And by the way, all these electronic tools that have been developed over the years, those are articles of divination. They're no different than a Ouija board. They're no different than tarot cards. They're no different than any other uh, occult method of communicating with the dead, folks. And I watch these people and they crack me up because they ask questions and they perceive that they get answers and they believe every word that comes back to them. Never once did they question, never once did they doubt. And if they're able to research and find out that uh, something that came back coincided with the history of the property or the individual, whatever the case might be. All of a sudden, they take that as lending credibility to the invisible entity. But there are human beings who have done their research and who have turned around. It makes me think of that movie years ago, um, I'm trying to think of what it was called again, Six Degrees of Separation or something to that effect, where this guy uh, went out and presented himself as being a part of a very wealthy family, you know, very rich. And uh, he was able to scam people left and right. He was able to pull off all kinds of deception. And that was in the, in the natural world where people could have done research. People could have looked into it to try to figure out if he really was who he said he was. How much more when you're dealing with the spirit realm? There is a reason why God prohibited any kind of activity related to the spirit realm. And that is because demons are deceptive. They are deceivers. They will go to any length in the world to convince you that they are something or someone that they are not. And if in the process of convincing you of this, they are able to make you embrace a belief that contradicts the word of God, then you begin to fall into what we talked about last week, you begin to fall into the trap of an evil heart of unbelief because now you're no longer believing God's word. You're no longer believing God. You're believing what this invisible entity 
is making you believe. You're believing the message, not necessarily that they're preaching, because oftentimes it's not a matter of what they say. It's a matter of what they're able to convince people of that contradicts the Word of God just by reason of interacting in this way. If I can convince people that I'm the ghost of an old lady that used to live in this house and, oh, I died this terrible, tragic death and now I'm stuck here, where's God? Where's God in all this? Apparently, there is no God. Apparently, after death, uh, there is no God. You can choose to stay here. You can get stuck in the middle, so to speak. And poor God is powerless to call you to judgment. Oh, no, there are people, according to these programs, there are people who choose to stay here because they're afraid of the judgment to come. They're afraid of what will happen on the other side. So they choose to stay here. Folks, that makes God look like some kind of a weakling. That makes God look like a liar. The Word of God says it is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. The Word of God says for believers to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The Word of God says there was a man named Lazarus who lay at the gate of a rich man. The rich man died. Lazarus died. Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom, and the rich man was in hell. Nowhere in here. The rich man didn't wander around. Lazarus didn't wander around. No. Your destination is established in this life by reason of your faith or your absence thereof. These invisible entities want to convince people that the Word of God is a lie, that it is inaccurate, that God is, is that this book does not contain truth. If it's not truthful about there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun, then who on earth can believe it when it says ye must be born again? So we have to be very, very careful. There is a reason why God put such a severe, attached such a severe penalty to those who engaged in these type of practices uh, when the children of Israel were going into the land of Canaan. Because this is probably the most dangerous activity that anybody can engage in. It can lead to flat out um, disbelieving God, disbelieving his word, or it can lead us to the worship of false gods and false uh, idols. We've got people, the Catholic Church, <laughs> they go into these settings and these situations and you've got a priest bringing a medium with him. You've got a priest bringing in somebody who practices divination and communication with the dead. Folks, that kind of activity is dangerous. That kind of association and interaction is dangerous. Even these um, so-called ghost hunters and paranormal professionals who keep bringing in these so-called uh, psychics and mediums and all this other, um, by interacting with these people who in fact may be interacting with spirits, the spirits may not be what they think they are, but by interacting with people who have these spirits, they're opening themselves up to vexation. They're opening themselves up to attachment. So it's very dangerous. So we need to steer clear if we know somebody engages in idolatrous practice, false belief, worship of a false god, or 
occult uh, type practices, then we ought to avoid any interaction uh, with those type of activities, okay? Also, now moving on, the enemy, Satan, evil spirits, take advantage of false doctrine and false teaching. One's embracing false doctrine is an opportunity for Satan to gain a stronghold in the lives of those who have done so. Lying spirits, spirits of deception, and spirits of spiritual blindness take advantage of anyone's lack of sincerity in seeking and loving truth. Many will choose to believe false doctrine and accept as truth false information, listen carefully, not because they are fully persuaded of the message, but because of any number of other motivations, ranging from a desire to belong, social connection, or any number of reasons. Sometimes people do it for marriage. There are people, this is why the Word of God teaches, be ye not unequally yoked with unbelievers. Sometimes people will convert to another religion simply out of their devotion to their spouse-to-be. And uh, this is dangerous when you do that, when you knowingly embrace something that you may not in fact fully understand or believe, you are opening a door. You are inviting a spirit of deception. You're inviting a spirit of false doctrine. You're inviting a spirit of spiritual blindness to come on the scene. And they're going to do everything in their power to push that door open and push that door open until stronger and more powerful and higher ranking spirits are able to uh, enter and really bring you to utter destruction. In 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 3, the Word of God warns, Paul writes, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, expressly, he said, the Holy Ghost is specifically wanting me to specifically highlight this prophetic word, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, listen, giving heed to seducing spirits. He didn't say giving heed to false teachers, giving heed to false prophets. No, 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 no. Giving heed to seducing spirits because spirits operate in and with and through false doctrine. He said, giving heed to seducing spirits, now listen, and doctrines of devils. So there are teachers out there who are literally teaching things that are inspired in hell, things that demonic powers have literally inspired within them to teach. Some of these cults are full of teaching that is so vile and so rank and so contrary to the Word of God, it isn't even funny. Mormonism, Jesus and Lucifer are brothers, and the God we serve was once a man who, like a good, like any good Mormon, who arose and and uh, did as he was supposed to, so that he might become a god. And now he lives off on a planet called Kebab. Literally, folks, this isn't this isn't fiction. This is truth and oversees planet Earth, and he and his spiritual wife are having babies, and as good Mormons are, and people on Earth are having children, those spiritual babies born over there on Kebab with uh, the uh, 
the God of this world, uh, they're given bodies. They now come to earth. They existed before here as spiritual babies. Now they come to earth and occupy a human body. And you too can be as God as Satan lied to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and told them that is Mormon doctrine. That is doctrine of devils, folks. Satan taught it in the Garden of Eden, and Mormonism teaches it every single day. You can be as God. You can aspire to Godhood if you're willing to embrace Mormonism and be a good Mormon and do all the things that a good Mormon is supposed to do and go through the temple rituals and wear their magic underwear. I mean, folks, it's insane. But people are giving heed to seducing spirits because these spirits operate with, in, and through false doctrine. This is why I said before, you do not play footsies with people who uh, embrace these belief systems. You do not invite them into your home. The Word of God says you're not even supposed to bid them God bless you or God speak. You're literally not, if, if a Mormon or Jehovah's Witness knocks on your door, uh, you say, thank you very much, but I'm not interested. You don't have to be mean-spirited. You don't have to be cruel. But then you shut the door. You don't say, God bless you. You don't say anything that would, for a second, place any kind of support behind what they're doing. Okay? So he uses false doctrine. Continues. Um the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Of course, Jehovah's Witnesses teach that God made Michael the archangel into the man Jesus, and that as a man he was nothing more than a man. He was not God in any way, shape, size, or form. He was just a human being. After he died and resurrected, and uh, he was not physically resurrected, which again contradicts the teaching of Scripture. They claim that the body that died evaporated and that God simply prepared for him a new body. And when he, when he uh, emerged three days later, it was Michael the Archangel appearing as Jesus in this wonderful play. And he now had a new body that God had given him. But the other body, the old body, the body that died had simply evaporated. Folks, if you understand what these people teach, you'll understand that they've given heed to seducing spirits and they're embracing doctrines of devils. He goes on to say, listen, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. False doctrine is false information. The only way to ensure liberty and freedom from demonic influences is to love, listen to me, is to love and embrace the truth. There's a lot of people out there, they'll tell you they love the truth, but anything that contradicts what they've already embraced, what they've already chosen to believe, what they've already come to understand. It doesn't matter if, if you can show it to them in the Word of God as clear as a bell. doesn't matter. They're still going to reject it. Why? Because they really don't love truth. When you love the truth, 
the word of God said, buy the truth and sell it not. Hallelujah. If there's anything in this universe you want to have in your possession, it is the truth of God. And once you get it, baby, don't you let it go. When I was wrestling many years ago, um, as one who grew up in the assemblies of God, and when I was wrestling with the notion of uh, the Trinity and one God in Christ, uh, I went home. I told the story before. I went home one evening uh, from church, and I sat down at my dining room table, and I said, Lord, I don't know what it was that night, but something that night was kind of the tipping point for me. And I said, Lord, I want to know the truth. I want to know it. I, I don't, uh, whatever it is, if it contradicts what I believed, fine. But I want to know the truth. Are you one or are you three? And the Spirit of the Lord told me, put my Bible on its spine on the table and let it fall open. So I did. I looked down and I began to read, and I was reading in the prophet, the Old Testament prophet, I am the Lord, that is my name, and beside me there is no God. The Spirit of the Lord said, flip pages. I flip, not any number of pages, I just flip pages at random. I looked down, I am the Lord, that is my name, and beside me there is no Savior. I am the Lord, that is my name, and beside me there is no other. The Lord hath sworn in truth unto David, he will not part from it of the fruit of thy body will I sit in thy throne. And I just went literally every passage, every single one that I looked at, every single one said over and over and over and over and over again that God is one. He is one. It's not a matter of trying to explain how the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are three. No, you need to understand there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. My God, people, good Lord Almighty, Trying to make three out of God is insane. He has said over and over and over and over that he is one. And from that day until this day, I have preached the, the oneness, one God message, and I have no intention of changing it because, honey, this preacher, this Christian, this believer loves the truth, and you can believe that completely contradicted what I grew up believing. But that's all right. I'm going to go with the truth because the only way to walk in liberty and victory in the power of the Holy Ghost is to embrace and love the truth. 1 John 4 and 6, We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. A lot of people read the Bible, but they don't heed the Bible. They read the words, they hear it preached, but they don't hear. They don't listen. They don't believe what it says. No, my pastor at First Baptist says what this really believe what this really means is, and they believe the pastor over the word of the Lord. Folks, what's different in that than what the Jehovah's Witnesses do or what the Mormons do? Nothing. But there are so-called Christian denominations that embrace the same identical practices as these cults. There are Christian denominations that do not love truth, and they will fight it. They will work against it. They will do everything in their power. I, I could go somewhere with this, but I'm not going to tonight because I'm going to try to finish up with the, these thoughts. 
2 Thessalonians 2, 7 through 12, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Listen, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. If you don't love truth, you will be turned over by God to a strong delusion so that you can go ahead and believe your lie and be happy with it. God's not going to fight you. God's not going to wrestle with you, try to make you believe the truth. No, if you're going to be saved, then you have to receive the love of the truth. And for this cause, verse 11, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Proverbs 23, 23, talked about it a minute ago, buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Jesus said in John 8, 32, and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. One example of a man who chose to believe false information rather than trust the word which in fact came from God was the king of Israel. In 1 Kings 22 verse 3, And the king of Israel said unto his servants, Know ye that Ramoth in Gilead is ours, and we be still, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria? So he's saying, this city is ours, it belongs to Israel. And here we sit, not doing anything to claim it back, having been conquered by Syria. Then in 1 Kings 22, verses 10 through 23, listen to the rest of the story. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat each on his throne having put on their robes in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets prophesied before them. And Zedekiah, the son of Chenana, made him horns of iron. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, With these shalt thou push the Syrians until thou have consumed them. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the king's hand. And the messenger that was gone to call Micah spake unto him, saying, Behold now, the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth, let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. And Micah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. So he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle? Or shall we forbear? And he answered him, Go and prosper. 
for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? So the king knew he wasn't telling him what the Lord really said. He knew that just like this old preacher, while there's all these evangelicals and all these Christian nationalists believe in the false prophets and the liars, I'm out there screaming into the wind the truth that God has spoken that I need to speak and I need to declare. And I cannot speak anything different. I can't go with the multitude. Can't go with the number. It's not in me. So the king says to him, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're saying what everybody else is saying. This isn't consistent with your reputation. Then Micah said, and he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? See, Micah said the Lord told him that the people of Israel need to go back to their house and stay calm and calm down, that this is not a time to be trying to go after this city and conquer this city. And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, and another said on that manner, listen, and there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. So God literally said, Go ahead, go do it. You be a lying prophet in the mouth of all this, uh, a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. You go ahead and do it. Because he knows that this guy is only going to do what he wants to do anyway. He's only going to hear what he wants to hear anyway. Verse 23, 1 Kings 22. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning the the king of Israel wanted to believe what he wanted to believe. Excuse me. He was happy with the messages coming from all his other so-called prophets, but he was not happy with Micah. Yet Micah told the king that the Lord had shown him that an evil spirit had volunteered to influence all all of the king's prophets, so that they should speak lies and not the truth. In other words, he would make certain that the king heard only what he wanted to hear, rather than the truth, which is what he needed to hear. How did it turn out? First Kings 22 30 through 37, and the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and enter into the battle, but put thou on thy robes. And the king of Israel disguised himself and went into the battle. But the king of Syria commanded his thirty and two captains that 
had rule over his chariots, saying, Fight neither with small nor great, save only with the king of Israel. And it came to pass, when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, that they said, Surely it is the king of Israel. And they turned aside to fight against him. And Jehoshaphat cried out. And it came to pass when the captains of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel, that they turned back from pursuing him. And a certain man drew a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. Wherefore he said unto the driver of his chariot, Turn thine hand and carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. And the battle increased that day, and the king was stayed up in his chariot against the Syrians and died at even. And the blood ran out of the wound into the midst of the chariot. And there went a proclamation throughout the host about the going down of the sun, saying, Every man to his city, and every man to his own country. So the king died and was brought to Samaria, and they buried the king in Samaria. Oh, the king thought he was going to be slick. So God's prophet said that I'm going to get killed in this battle, huh? Well, I'll just, I'll just fool God. I'm going to tell you, folks, there are a lot of preachers out there today. There are a lot of Christians out there today playing this same game. They know what the Word of God says. They hear the warnings of Scripture for those that do not love the truth. And yet they turn around and think that somehow they're going to connive and they're going to get over on God. Somehow they're going to be able to fool God in the end. It doesn't work that way. In this story, a man uh, simply drew his bow and he shot an arrow up into the air. And purely by chance, quote unquote, that arrow found its way to the perfect spot in the king's armor to pierce through and kill him. Sweetheart, if you think you're going to play games with God, if you think you're going to uh, embrace whatever false teaching or whatever false doctrine, if you think you can just go ahead and choose what you want to believe instead of loving truth and believe in the truth, uh, I've got news for you. God knows how to find you, no matter how you may be uh, disguised. In 2 Corinthians 4, I'm going to try to finish these scriptures real quick tonight. 2 Corinthians 4. Well, I got a lot. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid from them to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Romans 6, 17 and 18. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. In Romans 10, 16, and 17, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Second Peter 2 and 1, But there were false prophets also among the people, 
even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. 1 John 4 and 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. I've shared this story before. I'll share it as I close this evening. Over the years, I visited, I visited, I have visited many churches, and uh, I go in, and you know, I'm not trying to be anybody. I'm not trying to represent myself as anything spe special or spectacular. But I've spoken with pastors, and I've had pastors say, I want you to come preach for us, or I want you to share some thoughts with our congregation. And they said, there's something about your spirit that I love. There's something in your spirit that just rings genuine and true. You know, you're a man that loves truth, and I got news for you, honey. Uh, you can tell when you're dealing with somebody who loves truth. And uh, if you try the spirits, if you try the spirit that is behind 90% of these television preachers, you'll realize that they are not operating under the auspices of God's anointing. Oh, but pastor, like the false prophets with King Jehoshaphat, they're saying what I want them to say. Their message rings true to me because I like their message. I like what they're saying. Well, sweetheart, I hope you're comfortable experiencing the same destruction that Jehoshaphat experienced because that's what's coming for people that do not love the truth. People who are careless, people who open doors to demonic spirits of deception and false doctrine, to lying spirits. We've got a man on the political scene in America today that the first time I heard him make a political speech, I said, Dear Jesus, that man has a lying spirit. There, there's a demon that literally just pushes one statement after another statement after another statement after another statement out of his mouth, and not one thing he ever says is true. He lies habitually. He lies constantly. And yet, we have all kinds of preachers and prophets in the church today who are trying to convince God's people that this lying demon is for real and telling the truth. You better learn to try the spirits because Satan sees anything less than a love for the truth as an open door. And many, many believers today are living with vexation. They're living with demonic oppression. And many who profess Christianity, but in reality are not genuinely born again, never have been, are possessed by demons, and they are doing everything in their power. The Word of God said in the last days, the way of truth should be evil spoken of. And Satan working in and through people who claim to be, to be believers, people who claim to be Christians, and yet they're living lives that are completely contradictory in every conceivable way with the teaching of New Testament 
Christianity are causing the reputation of the church, causing the reputation of the Christian faith to suffer. And many sincere people are leaving the church because they're not blind. They see what's going on. But the insincere people are staying there and they're following their false prophets. They're following their false teachers. They're following their false leaders. They're not trying the spirits. And my friend, they will be given over to a reprobate mind. They're going to be given over so that they might believe a lie. God does not force himself. He does not force his truth upon anyone. That's why the church is called to preach. We're not called to force it down people's throats. We're not called to uh, make laws to try to uh, regulate uh, righteousness and godliness. No, no, no. We're called to preach. And then from there, it is upon the hearer to believe it and receive it and obey it or to reject it and to receive the end that comes with those who reject the gospel. All right, I believe we're done for this week. Next week, we will continue with our study, Ghost Ghouls and Bumps in the Night. Uh, it's going to get a, a whole lot better. We've got some really good stuff that'll be coming up. But again, you're going to find out that all of this is the foundation upon which we'll be building as we look into these other things. If you'll bow your heads with me one more time, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, once again, God, we come boldly before the throne of grace as children of God. As the word of God says that we have the right and the privilege as the adopted sons and daughters of the Almighty. We thank you, Lord, for the truth of God. We thank you for the word of the Lord. We thank you for your spirit, which you promised us would lead us and guide us into all truth. Master, help each and every one of us to love the truth of God. Lord, to buy the truth and sell it not. When we see and understand, when we're recipients of revelation, let us walk in that revelation and not reject it as so many others have done simply because it was not convenient. It did not mesh with what mommy and daddy taught me. It doesn't mesh with what I was taught in Sunday school. It's not what I've been taught all these years that I've been going to church. And yet, Lord, they can see it's scripture. It's the word of God. Oh, Lord, today help this old preacher Lord, I tell you, you called me as a child to prophetic ministry. The closer we get to the end of this thing, the harder this job is becoming. So often I feel, God, like we stand alone proclaiming a word from the Lord. But Master, today, while it may be true that the prophets of Baal are 400, and I alone am a prophet of God, is. Elijah said, it's also true, Lord, that in response to sincere prayer, you will rain down fire from heaven to consume our sacrifice, to consume our altar, and to bring to an end the lies and the deceptions of those who would lead God's people astray. Master, make us soul winners. Help us to build a church in this community. Lord, my vision is not numbers. It's not about numbers. I could care less about numbers. But let the people that come love you, want to worship you, want to praise you, want to live for you with passion, 
want to seek your face and want to sincerely live the Christian life as we're called to live. Not judging one another, not criticizing one another, but rather, Lord, loving, supporting, encouraging, inspiring one another. Loving one another, Lord, as you've called us to love. Oh, Master, in the name of Jesus, keep the lost always at the forefront of our thinking. For, Lord, we haven't much time. The night is come, and there are few hours left in which we shall be able to work. We thank you, Master, tonight for this study, for this time together. Go with us from this place, O God. Each and every one, keep us in your care. Protect, guard, and guide. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Once again, I want to invite you, if you live in the Huntsville, Alabama area, we'd love to have you come be with us on Sunday at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time. Uh, we do our service in the middle of the day at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, that gives people who work late nights and people who work an opportunity to actually rest. Sunday is supposed to be a day of rest and rejuvenation, as well as, of course, the Lord's Day. So uh, by doing our service at 3, gives people a chance to rest. You can go out to brunch. Then you can come to church, get ready to shout, dance, and run the aisles. Let the power of God flow and move. Let's sing the songs of Zion like we mean them. And then you can move into the next week with fire in your belly, boldness in your soul, ready to live the Christian life so that you might be a testimony to a lost and dying world. Sunday, 3 o'clock at the Century Office Center, 3322 Memorial Parkway Southwest, suite number 537, uh, Huntsville, Alabama, 35801. Come be with us. Until we meet again, God bless you. In Jesus' name is our prayer.